All right, so let's go ahead and get started with Macbeth Act One, Scene One. Now, this is going to be a little bit different than what you guys are used to with pretty much any kind of story or play because there's no introduction whatsoever. You know, so remember, that's the kind of part of the story where everybody hates it and they're just like, this is so boring because this is the setting. These are the characters. This is what's going on. And then eventually they go ahead and put like what all the problems are. But no, Shakespeare's just like, no, we're gonna start the play. And so this is like super revolutionary at this time period to not have a super long exposition. Now, drama back then had like these multiple scenes and storylines, but he just went and pared it down to just the action in order to make people have to listen very carefully for clues. So that's your first thing is you are going to have to go and listen very, very carefully with this play. So let's go ahead and begin. Act one, scene one, a barren heath lashed by thunder and lightning. Enter three witches. When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly burly's done, when the battle's lost and won. That will be ere the set of sun. Where the place? Upon the heath. There to meet with Macbeth. I come, Grey Malkin. Paddock calls. Anon. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. Hover through the fog. And filthy air. And they vanish into the mist. And that's the end of scene one already. <laughs> Well, already with these witches, we already know that they're going to be important because they're the first characters that are coming on up here. But do they seem like they are good or bad in this case? Yeah, they do not seem good. They're terrible. And they're, I really wish that you could see this because they're so disgusting and gross. And I love that in there. So they're supposed to be like these wizen shaped of all shriveled up. And remember that back then for Shakespeare, women didn't act. Women weren't allowed upon the stage. So you have like these dudes up on the stage, probably with their beards, all like hunched over and sounding kind of manly and they're saying this stuff i love that mental image with that so they're supposed to be like super super scary therefore symbolically should we trust them should we be like oh they're gonna be our new best friends not so much <laughs> so they're supposed to symbolize that evil and just terribleness so they're saying when are we going to go and meet again when are we going to go and meet up and it's going to be after the hurly burly is done which is yes a battle and the the battle is going to be with this guy named sueno and his lords and they have come to take over scotland so it is like sueno and his dudes up against the people of scotland and they are duking it out and the witches are like, we're not going to meet again until after the battle. And then we will go and meet upon the heath and meet with somebody named Macbeth. And I love how they say that. Like, I love the audio for this. Like, these people are so great. I love it how they're just like, Macbeth. <laughs> it's so gross and nasty looking. I love it. It just makes me so happy. And so, yes, when the battle's all done, they're going to meet again and see someone named Macbeth. But why do the witches plan to meet with him? What do you think 
the connection is. And automatically, because they're talking about Macbeth, does that make us think that he's good or that he's bad? He's bad. Because you have these, or maybe he will be corrupted. Yeah, absolutely. And so that is the end of scene one. Can you imagine just sitting in there and, you know, like you're sitting down, you're expecting it to be a long play and that's what opens? You're just like, wait, did I miss something? What happened? What? Yeah, like, did, did I go get popcorn a little bit too long? Not that they had that back then, but still it's like, wait, 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 wait. And so Shakespeare did that intentionally to go and make people just like super freaked out and be like, wait, 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 what, 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 what is going on here? And now we're into scene two. Yes. Yes, he definitely wanted to get everyone's attention. And well, what do you think? Did he succeed? Did he get your attention? Yeah. So now scene two is going to be a battlefield. Now, remember that this is a play, it's not a movie. And so they can't go and like have all these people up on the stage and battling it out. It's just not, it's not feasible. They, they don't need to pay all those people. So it's gonna be a part of the battle. So here we go. Act one, scene two. A military camp in the midst of battle. Enter King Duncan, Malcolm, Donalbane, and Lennox. A captain is lying on the ground, badly wounded, and he's being attended to. What bloody man is that? He can report as seemeth by his plight of the revolt the newest state. This is the sergeant, who like a good and hardy soldier fought against my captivity. Hail, brave friend. <sighs> Say to the king the knowledge of the broil as thou didst leave it. All right, so I'm going to cut in there with this. So we have King Duncan. He's a good king, just as a heads up. We have his son, Malcolm. We have his other son, Donald Bain. We have Lennox. We have some other guys. And they are meeting with this sergeant who has just come from the battlefield. And he's bleeding out. Like, he's going to die. This poor guy. And it's not like they had like really good medical intervention back then either. Now, to give you a little bit of background, the Vikings have been pillaging and plundering for the last two years. So that's who is coming and trying to attack Scotland is going to be the Vikings. So think like all kinds of Thors running around there. OK, am I being stereotypical with that? Yes. But is it a really good mental image? Yes. <laughs> so King Duncan comes on in. And he wants to go and get some news about this final battle that's, in, that's going on. And he's going to get this information from this poor man who's bleeding out. So I just feel so bad for this sergeant because the entire time, I always kind of think that it's like a stomach wound. And those are going to be like super painful, you know, because like as soon as you're stabbed in the stomach, then like the intestinal fluid is going to be going through and it's just going to be painful. But this guy loves his king so much that he's just going to go and like power through it because he wants his king to know what's going on. But I feel really bad for him. No, no, he's, he's a really good king. So he's like the sweetest thing ever. He's a good leader. And so he is like super patriotic and is not going to be scared of his king whatsoever. He's going to be like, I am honored to go and meet the king because this is like my idol. He's just that amazing and glorious. Doubtful it stood. As two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. The merciless MacDonald, worthy to be a rebel, for to that the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him. From the western isles of Kearns and gallow glasses is supplied, and fortune, on his damned quarrel smiling, showed like a rebel's whore. But all is too weak, for brave Macbeth, well he deserves that name, disdaining fortune with his brandished steel which smoked with bloody execution. 
like Valor's minion carved out his passage till he faced a slave, which ne'er shook hands nor bade farewell to him, till he unseamed him from the nave to the chops and fixed his head upon our battlements. Oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. I just absolutely love this part. So, the theme of fate is established here, okay? So, they're like, man, it didn't look good. It looked like we were going to lose, and it was going to be terrible. The Vikings were going to win, and then we have a traitor introduced, and his name is McDonald, okay? Um, just as a heads up, it's not spelled like McDonald, of like McDonald's, you know, like I'm loving it with the golden arches. It's spelled like McDonwald, which is just kind of weird, but that's the way of it. It's all good. So this traitor named McDonald seemed as if he was going to win at first, but then fate seemed to be smiling down upon him and fate will go and turn on him. And then Shakespeare goes and paints this vivid portrait of Macbeth. We haven't met this guy yet, even though the entire play is about this guy, but he has not appeared yet. But it's in the midst of battle. And for some reason, I always think that it's like super foggy. I don't know why, but this is my imagery here. And so he's like surrounded by all of these people and he's just brandishing his double-edged sword and he's killing so many people that his, his sword is like almost smoking from like all of this like murder and mayhem. And Macbeth is like, no, no, fate. I shall not listen to you. I don't agree with this. And instead he goes and brandishes his sword about and he kills anyone in his path until he reaches McDonald's. Whew. Can you just imagine like that, that moment, like cinematically of how it'd be like that, that pause of where he's gonna go and just like stand there looking like heaving a little bit, you know, cause he's a little bit out of breath from killing everybody, all of the traitors and all of the Vikings. And then they lock eyes. And then the battle begins, Macbeth versus MacDonald. And then they start fighting. And what do you think this means? It says, um, till he faced a slave, which never shook his hands nor bade farewell to him, till he unseamed him from the nave to the chops and fixed his head upon our battlements. So what do you do with the sword? This is probably my favorite lines ever of the entire play he goes and takes other way he takes his sword it's double-edged okay he goes around and cuts mcdonald from the what is it the nave to the chops so from his like the apex of his thighs okay so like where the legs come together all the way up to his throat He's that powerful. He went and unseamed someone is what that's called. And so his innards become his outards and they just go. Vroom. I'm definitely unfortunate for McDonald, but man for Macbeth, he's just like. <laughs> he's doing a little happy dance of like, yeah, I've been working out. Oh yeah. That would just be so intense. So Macbeth cut him open. His innards became his outards. And then he cut off his head and put it on a pike. And then I love this, like so low key impressed. Duncan's just like, oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. He's like, I'm proud of that. Yeah, I like that. Go, go Macbeth. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Let's continue. As whence the sun gins his reflection, ship racking storms and direful thunders break, so from that spring whence comfort seemed to come, discomfort swells. Mark! King of Scotland, Mark! No sooner justice had, with valour armed, compelled these skipping kerns to trust their heels, but the Norwegian lord surveying vantage with furbished arms, and new supplies of men began a fresh assault. Dismayed not this, our captains, Macbeth and Banquo. We cut in there again, I'm sorry. 
So then when the sun rose again, more Vikings came. Oh, no. And there was more battling. Oh, no. But then the coming storm raises the tension and it's as if nature goes and reflects the world of man, okay? And that's gonna be like really, really, really important, okay? Macbeth's actions physically affect the world, which is known as pathetic fallacy, okay? So pathetic fallacy, which is also known as pathos, P-A-T-H-O-S. And that's where man controls nature's actions. Okay, so pathetic fallacy is going to be very, very, very important in this book. Ugh, so gross. And so Duncan's just like, how did Macbeth and Banquo take this? So now we have another hero introduced. We already had Macbeth introduced, and he's already like uber powerful. But now we have another hero, and his name is Banquo. And even though we haven't met them, we already know their feats from the dying captain. And we're just all like, there are heroes. We love them. You know, we're super excited about them. So now let's see what the sergeant has to say. Yes, the sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion. If I say sooth, I must report, they were as cannons overcharged with double cracks. So they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe, except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds or memorize another Golgotha, I cannot tell. I am faint. Oh, my gash is cry for help. So well thy words become thee as thy wounds. They smack of honor both. Go, get him, surgeons. The captain is led away. That poor guy's been bleeding out this entire time. <laughs> I feel so bad for him. Now he gets to go and die in the corner. Let's face it, he's going to die. Poor guy. Oh, I always feel so bad. He's like the unsung hero of Macbeth. He never even gets a name. It's just a sergeant. But I adore him. So Duncan's like, what happened? King Duncan, sorry. And the sergeant's just like, well, our heroes, Macbeth and Banquo, they weren't afraid. Oh, no. They started killing so much that it looked like a slaughterhouse. Now, Macbeth is portrayed as this pretty violent killer. But because he's on the good side, he's considered to be a hero. And he's also compared to an eagle and a lion. So when you think of an eagle and a lion, you have like this dual image coming up of like this very, these very violent and yet very noble creatures. I mean, like, a lot of the times we use lions and eagles in order to be like, yeah, they're cool. We like them, you know? And then when he, this poor guy, I just feel so bad for him when he's like, oh, <laughs> except they meant to bathe in reeking wounds or memories, another Golgotha, I cannot tell. And then he's like, but I cannot tell. I'm faint, my gashes cry for help. He's like, I'm really hurting. Like I am bleeding out here. I have about like three minutes to live and that's about it. And Duncan's just like, Yes, your words and your 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 wounds, reek of honor. I appreciate you. You may go now. <laughs> oh, poor guy. Um, so if you're just like, I have no idea what Golgotha is, that is going to be um, a Christian reference, a Christian allusion. And that means that they are seemingly recreating Golgotha. And that was known as the slaughtering of people in Golgotha, which is the place where um, Christ was crucified. So you have to remember the time period that in Shakespeare's time in England, in Britain, I should say, excuse me, pretty much everybody was Christian. And so everyone's going to get that illusion and that reference. And they'd be like, oh, no, that's not good. Um, and so then this poor sergeant's about to pass out from his blood loss. That's not good. So it's just supposed to give everyone who's sitting in the audience, like an imagery of like this field of just bodies everywhere. Just, it's a bloodbath. And so now this poor guy gets to go and, and die in the corner. Now, Ross is going to enter. I'm just going to give you a heads up right now because there's a lot of just kind of bland names throughout this. Ross 
always is going to bring bad news. So think of Ross from Friends. You know how he's kind of like, hi. You know, he's just kind of like, I don't know, he's kind of the Debbie Downer of, of the group a little bit, uh, especially like in the earlier seasons before he like went super weird. Um, and so I always kind of picture Ross Geller with this character. So you're welcome for that. Who comes here? Enter Ross and Angus. The worthy thane of Ross. What a haste looks through his eyes. So should he look that seems to speak things strange. God save the king. Whence camest thou, worthy thane? From Fife, great king. Where the Norwegian banners flout the sky and fan our people cold. Norway himself, with terrible numbers assisted by that most disloyal traitor, the thane of Cawdor, began a dismal conflict. Till that Bellona's bridegroom, lapped in proof, confronted him with self-comparisons, point against point, rebellious arm against arm, curbing his lavish spirit, and to conclude, the victory fell on us. Great happiness! Can we just go and, like, recognize that Duncan is, like, the king of, literally the king of, like, low-key happiness <laughs> whenever he's just like yeah that's good he's just like great happiness i mean what a kingly thing to do i would not be that person i would be the one who's like yeah i won you know like i am not a very good uh, winner apparently like i'll go and rub it in people's faces but he's just like low-key about it he's like mm, yeah okay so Ross has come from Fife, and I wanted to go and show you real quick where Fife is. So let me go and pull that out. So Fife is in the UK. So again, we have the United Kingdom here, which is all of this, except for, um, was it Northern Ireland? No, except for Ireland down there. They're just like, no, they're their own. Um, Northern Ireland's part of the UK. So Scotland's up here. Do, 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 do. Boop. And let's go into Fife. Fife is like right up in here. So he has just come from Fife and that is, there was another battle there, okay? Um, and that's where the Vikings are at. Um, so there is a second traitor in Scotland, and his name is the Thane of Cawdor, and he was also helping Swaino, but then Macbeth put on his armor, that's what lapped in proof means, um, and fought him. So he was defeated, but he wasn't killed, and then... Um, Macbeth is compared to Roman, and he's not given a Christian comparison, but pagan. And so that's what Bellona's bridegroom means. Okay, so that is going to be very key for again this time period, because he's given a Christian comparison, not or excuse me, he's given a pagan comparison, not a Christian comparison. And so that is going to like separate him from like everybody else. That makes him quote unquote different. And so even though most people who are sitting in the audience wouldn't really understand it at that point, it'd be kind of like subconscious. And they'd be like, oh, he's different. We can't trust him. He's not like us. Um, now, just remember that pagan simply means non-Christian. It's fine to be pagan. It's fine. But in Shakespeare's time, historically, this would have been a very big deal and it was seen as like a very old religion with lots and lots of superstition. So people would just be like, they'd be getting their guard up. They'd be like, oh, I don't know about this. I don't like it. So that's where we're at with that. So let's go ahead and start again. Here we go. That now, Sueno, the Norway's king, craves composition. Nor would we deign him burial of his men till he dispersed at St. Columns Inch $10,000 to our general use. 
All right, so Sueno. Sueno is spelled S-W-E-N-O, by the way. Like, I don't know, I always wanna go and misspell that. So just wanted to give you a heads up on that one. He's Norway's king and he wants a ceasefire because he's like, I cannot go up against Macbeth because this guy just keeps killing everybody and I don't like this. <laughs> but Macbeth is like, mm, all right, I'll give you a ceasefire, but I'm gonna go and keep everyone's dead bodies until you pay up, Sueno. So he's holding the dead bodies hostage. Now, this is important because of Viking lore. Viking lore believed that people couldn't enter heaven unless their bodies had been buried. So Macbeth's being kind of a jerk here. <laughs> Macbeth and Ross, because Ross is in on this too, they're holding these dead bodies ransom. Dang, that's intense. How do you think Duncan's going to feel about that? Like, do you think he's going to be like, that's not cool? Or do you think he's going to be like, I'm all right with it? I mean, it's a battle. You got to do what you got to do, I guess. So let's see what he does. No more that thane of Cordor shall deceive our bosom interest. Go, pronounce his present death, and with his former title, greet Macbeth. I'll see it done. What he hath lost, noble Macbeth hath won. And that is the end of scene two. Whew, that was a lot. Okay, so this end of the scene echoes the witches from the first scene. And so that's a very, very sophisticated type of transition. Duncan now plans to put the Thane of Cawdor to death because he was a traitor. He's like, yeah, I can't have my Thanes going and hooking up with like the King of Norway, trying to take over Scotland and trying to take me down. He has to be punished. So even though Macbeth did not kill him, he's going to go to jail and he will be put to death. And then he says... Um, with his former title, Greet Macbeth. So he's going to go and reward Macbeth for being such a great warrior. And he's going to go and give him this new title of the Thane of Cawdor, which is kind of nice. Um, and it's just to go and say thank you for his bravery, his leadership, and also his allegiance to Duncan. And that ends scene two.